staying through to the very last session today. I know this is an eagerly anticipated talk. Uh, I'd like to extend a warm welcome and introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Gabor Mate. Dr. Mate is a medical doctor recently retired from active practice. He was a family physician for two decades and during that time delivered many babies. For seven years, he served as the medical coordinator of the palliative care unit at Vancouver Hospital. For 12 years, he worked in the Vancouver downtown east side with patients challenged by hardcore addiction, mental illness, HIV, and related conditions. For two years, he was the on-site physician at, the Vancouver, at Vancouver's unique supervised injection site, North America's only such facility. He is internationally known for his work in the mind, body, unity in health and illness, on attention deficit disorder and other childhood developmental issues, and his breakthrough analysis of addiction as a psychophysiological response to childhood trauma and emotional loss. He is the author of four best-selling books published in 20 languages on five continents. Uh, these books are available here, by the way, at the Odin Book uh, booth outside those doors, and Dr. Mate will be available to sign them after this session. Uh, Dr. Mate is the recipient of an outstanding alumnus award from Simon Fraser University and an honorary degree of law from the University of Northern BC, among other awards. He frequently addresses professional and lay audiences in North America and internationally on issues related to childhood development and parenting, physical and mental health, and wellness and addiction. Please help me extend a warm welcome to Dr. Gabor Mate. Thank you. So the, I'm wearing a lapel mic. Does that carry? Can you hear me at the back OK? All right, thank you. Let me know if there's any problem with the sound. Uh, just to let you know, um, we'll have lots of time for questions, and I, I much um, would enjoy having a conversation with you rather than just didactically speaking at you for all this time. Uh, it's, uh, it's great to be speaking to uh, service providers who um, work with the very beginnings of life. Because what I've learned in um, 30 years of family practice, uh, oh sorry, 20 years of family practice, seven years in palliative care dealing with dying people, 12 years of addiction work and all the research that I've read and uh, also on considering my own experience, here's what I'll tell you and what I'll say will sound radical to you, uh, to some of you. It will sound like complete nonsense to most of my medical colleagues and yet something I believe is only the gospel truth and uh, entirely in line with modern science. And let me tell you parenthetically that the phrase that most upsets me in the medical world is the, when they talk about evidence-based practice. Because my, my response to that is I only wish that they would base their practice on the evidence. But there's a whole sh re uh, sheaves of evidence. There's a whole range of evidence that's utterly ignored uh, in the medical world. That's also um, less so in the nursing world, only because nurses are, um, well, two reasons, I think. Uh, one is that nurses tend to be, for the most part, women. And women are still more in touch with intuition than men are in our culture. Although that's, we're losing that too, by the way. And, uh, but the other reason is, is that people in nursing, midwifery and all that, they, they deal with human beings much more on a one-to-one -one personal level. So that it's not purely intellectually mind-driven. Whereas much of medical knowledge is very much just left brain driven and the left brain sees only a part of reality. And we call it science, but it isn't because it ignores a lot of reality, including a lot of scientifically proven reality. So here's the radical statement, which is that virtually everything I've ever seen, whether it's cancer, whether it's rheumatoid arthritis, whether it's mental illness like depression or anxiety or ADHD, whether it's addiction, all has its origin in early life experience. It all has its origin in early life experience. And so what happens to people very early in life 
has a determining inf influence on their physical, emotional, and psychic, and spiritual health for a lifetime. Fortunately, it's not written in stone, it's not irreversible, but in order to reverse the impacts of early loss and early um, acquired dysfunction, we have to be conscious of it. We have to be aware of the connections. And without that kind of awareness, we can give cures, we can provide symptom relief, but we cannot possibly offer healing. Nor can we actually prevent or give the advice that's required to prevent the onset of illness, physical or mental, without the awareness of those early influences. Now again, I'm fully aware that this statement would seem uh, outlandish and radical. I will now give you why I believe so and I'll also present to you some of the scientific evidence for uh, this belief. So, first of all, let's look at how we look at human beings and how we look at uh, illness. So, by and large, uh, the mainstream view in which I was trained at the University of British Columbia separates the mind from the body and separates the individual from the environment. So, if I have cancer, if I develop cancer, that's because of some lifestyle choices that I've made, like smoking cigarettes, or because of genetic predispositions, or because of bad luck that we don't understand. But, uh, but what is not considered is that how my emotional life and how my relationships with other people and with myself throughout a lifetime may have contributed to the onset of that disease. So for the most part, we call these illnesses idiopathic. In other words, we don't know their causation. Secondly, so we separate the mind from the body. Secondly, we separate the individual from the environment. So that when somebody develops a disease, that's just their individual problem. It, it arose for whatever reason, but it arose in a discrete human body whose connections and relationships with other human bodies and other human beings has very little to do with the onset of that illness. And this is true whether we consider ADHD or rheumatoid arthritis or multiple sclerosis or any other health condition. In other words, we take a very strictly biological and individual view of illness and dysfunction. <clears throat> now, there's a, another view which I'll illustrate for you. Uh, and that's called the biopsychosocial perspective. And the biopsychosocial perspective considers that you cannot separate the biology of an individual from their emotional, psychological, or social relationships and social context. So that when a problem arises in an individual, that actually is a marker for a problem in the larger context of which that individual is a part. Let me give you three examples of what I mean by biopsychosocial before launching into the main body of my talk. So, we know from multiple studies that children whose parents are stressed are much more likely to have asthma. So in one study, for example, in polluted areas where the pollution itself is a risk factor for asthma, but it's still the children of parents who are most stressed emotionally who are most likely to develop the asthma. We also know, and I'll come back to this later, that infants or fetuses who experience smoking or smoke exposure while in the uterus are more likely to develop asthma if their, parent, if their mother is stressed on top of the smoking. Now, what's the connection between a young child's breathing function and the emotional stresses of the parent? What's the possible connection? Well, consider for a moment, and many of you will know, being of a medical background, healthcare background, you'll know that how we treat asthma is with uh, 
inhalers or medications to open up the airways because the air tubes go into spasm, so we have to open them up. And there's inflammation in the airway, so we have to suppress the inflammation. So what do we give in order to suppress the inflammation? We give cortisol. And what do we give in order to open up the airways? We give adrenaline or copies of adrenaline and cortisol. Now, what are adrenaline and cortisol? As you all know, they're the stress hormones. They're the stress hormones manufactured by our adrenal glands when we're stressed. In other words, we're treating a condition with stress hormones. Should we maybe ask ourselves, gosh, is it possible that there's a connection to stress? And of course there is, because physiologically what happens is, is when the, uh, the parents are stressed, guess what? The children are stressed. They can't help it. So their stress system is working overtime. It gets exhausted. The body no longer responds to the body's own stress hormones. Now we have to give them extra stress hormones to keep the airways open. It's a physiological connection in response to emotional stress. What I'm saying, it's biopsychosocial. Because why are the parents stressed? because they live in a society that stresses them. Why do we have an epidemic of asthma these days? Because stress. It's a biopsychosocial perspective. Let's look at two more examples of what I mean by biopsychosocial. In a study in Australia, and this is, I mean, this is only an example, but in a study in Australia, they looked at 500 women with breast lumps that were considered suspicious enough for malignancy that they had to be biopsied. So these women underwent a biopsy. And before the results came back, the women also underwent a psychological interview. Now after the results were collated, it was found that if a woman was emotionally stressed prior to the onset of that lump, that by itself did not increase the risk of that lump being cancerous. Zero effect. Similarly, if a woman was emotionally isolated, that by itself did not increase the chance of the lump being cancerous. Zero effect, right? So far, so good. But guess what? It also turned out that if a woman was emotionally stressed and, emo and emotionally isolated, the risk of that lump being cancerous was nine times as great as the average. And the researchers could not explain this one because to them, how's a zero and zero add up to nine? But if you look at it from the biopsychosocial perspective, it's obvious, because here's the deal. Let's say uh, your name is Lubna. You, Lubna is stressed, and so the, being stressed means that the stressed hormones of cortisol and adrenaline are going through her body, and her um, heart rate is up, and she's nervous, and cortisol in the short term helps you deal with stress, but in the long term, what does it do? It give, makes you diabetic, increase the risk of heart disease, makes you depressed, thins your bones, ulcerates your intestines, and suppresses your immune system. But that's not a problem because uh, sitting next to Lubna is Christina, right? Is that, did I get your name right? Yeah, Christina. Uh, and Christina and Lubna are friends. And Christina says to Lubna, hey friend, how are you feeling? Do you want to talk about it? What happens to Lubna's stress levels in a split second? She calms right down, and the stress levels drop, and the hormone levels abate. Now her immune system is no longer under siege. But what happens if Lubna is emotionally isolated and stressed? Then she's alone with this uh, toxic soup that's coursing through her veins, maybe for months. Any wonder that the women who are emotionally isolated and stressed are more likely to have cancer, which also means that cancer, and I'm telling you, and I've seen this in palliative care and family practice over and over and again. Cancer is not the disease of an individual. It reflects a set of relationships, a lifelong set of relationships with yourself and the environment. And yes, the emotional apparatus has a lot to do with it. Why? Because you can't separate the mind from the body. It's unscientific to separate the mind from the body, just as the stress example illustrates. As soon as I scared you right now, if I did scare you, your body would change in a split second just because of the emotion of fear. So how can we possibly separate the mind from the body and try to understand disease in absence, in isolation from one and the other, and in isolation from the individual and the environment? So that's the second example of what I mean by biopsychosocial. The third one um, 
if you recall, uh, the BC Lions used to have a, a, a quarterback called Doug Flutie. And Flutie was a great football player. Now his parents just died in November of last year. The father died after, he was elderly and he died in the aftermath of a hip fracture in hospital, as you know is often the case. The mother died in one, in one hour later. One hour later. And we know from multiple studies that amongst elderly couples, when one of them is hospitalized, the other one is much more likely to die. Or that when one of them falls ill, the other one will have suppression of their immune activity. Why? Because the cardiovascular system, the nervous system, the immune system, the hormonal apparatus is actually modulated and kept balanced by our emotional relationships with other people. That's biopsychosocial. Now, if you look at early life now, and, and, and if I have time, I'll tell you how these early patterns or early emotional experiences actually result in cancer later on. But let me just tell you one simple fact. From a Canadian study, if you were abused as a child, your risk of cancer goes up nearly 50%, regardless of smoking and other factors. What's the connection? That's the subject of my talk. But again, it's a biopsychosocial perspective, which I think is the only scientific way to look at things. So, um, let me now come back to early experience. <clears throat> I was diagnosed with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder when I was in my mid-50s, er, early to mid-50s. And, uh, you know, the diagnosis really for me, it felt like a relief because it seemed to explain so much of, so many of my dysfunctions uh, in personal life and always being late and always being disorganized and having trouble paying attention if I wasn't interested and all, all this kind of stuff. The hallmark of ADD, not its only symptom, but its major symptom, is an automatic tuning out, an absent-mindedness. In other words, a dissociation. By the way, um, we tend to categorize people according to diagnoses, and we have this belief that there's the diagnosable people over there and the rest of us normal people over here. Well, I got news for you. What I've noticed in myself and throughout my practice years is that there's a continuum. And some people have the symptoms severe enough that we can diagnose them, but that doesn't mean that they're over there and the rest of us over here. There's actually a distribution of virtually any pattern throughout the population. Some people just have it in a higher concentration. Now we can diagnose them. But let's not think that the rest of us are that different. Anyway, so I was diagnosed with ADD uh, and, and this tuning out. Well, now, the medical belief about ADHD or ADD is that it's a, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a biological disease of the brain because we're fixated on biological diseases these days, and it's caused largely by genetics, which I never bought into for a minute, despite the fact that two of my kids were diagnosed. So there's proof. Father's got it. The kids got it. It's got to be genetic, right? No, it doesn't. I mean, none of my children became doctors, but if they had, would that prove that the practice of medicine is a genetic disease? <laughs> I mean, sometimes it looks like it might be, but, uh, but obviously things can happen in multiple generations where similar patterns are developed without any genetic input at all, or very little genetic input. But the, but the reason I didn't buy into the idea that this is a genetic condition is because I understood something, by that time I knew something, that the tuning out, the absent-mindedness, is not a disease, genetic or otherwise. What is it actually? Why do people have the capacity to tune out? Why do we have that? Why did nature make our brains automatically tune out sometimes? To cope with? To cope with stress. In other words, it's a coping mechanism. It's a coping mechanism. So now if you look at the burgeoning number of children being diagnosed with this and that disorder, with the fact that the number of prescriptions for ADHD has gone up 
as of three years ago, it had gone up 43% in the previous five years in this country. When you look at all the kids who are being diagnosed with ADD, ODD, OCD, uh, you know, oppositional defiant disorder, pervasive development disorder, autistic spectrum disorder, um, uh, reactive attachment disorder, all these disorders, and all the kids who are being medicated, and sometimes they're being medicated with antipsychotics, antipsychotics. We have no idea what the long-term impact of antipsychotics will be on the developing brain of our children because those studies have not been done yet. But we're giving them because we don't know what else to do with them. Why don't we know how to do with them? Because we're not looking at the whole picture. That's why. So at Children's Hospital here in Vancouver, they've had to establish a special clinic just to deal with the metabolic side effects of the antipsychotics on kids. What's going on? It can't be genetically driven because genes don't change in a population over 10 years or 20 years or even 100 years. So if we're seeing many, many more kids with troubled behaviors, it ain't the genes. There's something going on in our society that's causing that. As to what it is, since if you're looking at the simple example of ADD and the, and, and the tuning out, knowing that the tuning out is a coping mechanism, and it's a, it's a way that the brain deals with stress when the stress can't be handled, then the question we have to ask is, what is stressing our kids so much in our society? What's actually going on on a social level? Now, if, uh, I can give you the example of Windsor, Ontario, which in the year 2000 and 2009 saw the number of childhood and, and adolescent mental health visits go up 50% in one year. In Ontario, Canada's largest province, we're seeing the, the same pattern still going on. Now, what happened in Windsor, Ontario in 2008, 2009? What happened was that because of greed on Wall Street and short-sightedness in Detroit, the auto industry was in trouble. So the parents were stressed. So the kids are being taken to be diagnosed and medicated. So because of social, economic, and cultural factors, more kids were being diagnosed and medicated. But it's a biopsychosocial event. Yes, their brains are involved, but their brains are being affected by what's happening in the society around them. And, you know, I'm not going into a lot of personal history, but <clears throat> as to why I might have tuned out as an infant will be apparent to you if I tell you that I was born to Jewish parents in Nazi-occupied Hungary in 1944. That was my first year of life. So, three years ago, February of this year, in a journal, Pediatrics, official journal of the American Pediatric, Pediatric Association, the following article appeared from the Harvard Center on the Developing Child. The article is entitled, An Integrated Scientific Framework for Child Survival and Early Child Development. And here's what they say in their abstract. Growing scientific evidence demonstrates that social and physical environments that threaten human development because of scarcity, stress, or instability can lead to short-term physiologic and psychological adjustments that are necessary for immediate survival and adaptation, but which may come at a significant cost to long-term outcomes in learning, behavior, health, and longevity. In other words, the way young children adapt to early stress, to early distress, helps them endure those initial difficulties, but those same coping mechanisms become sources of pathology later on. In other words, something that's meant to be a temporary state becomes a long-term trait. So, as an infant, given what I've just told you, without going into any details, you can see why I might, might, have, might, might have spent a lot of my time tuning out during my first year of life. Let me read you a quote here, and this is very pertinent to your work. And you can imagine my mother's emotional states after her parents died in Auschwitz. And she had a, uh, an infant to look after, and my father was away in forced labor. The child is very open and can feel the pain and suffering going on in its immediate environment. The child is aware of its own body 
and can also feel the tension, rigidity, and pain in the body of the mother or of anyone else he's with. If the mother is suffering, the baby suffers too. The pain never gets discharged. The organism does not develop the confidence that it can regulate itself, that things will happen as they should. If the pain and frustration continue, they will have a disintegrating effect on the organism and the child will begin to experience organismic fear for its very survival. So if the, babies, if the mother suffers, the baby suffers too. How do babies deal with that? Well, one way to deal with it is to tune out. But when are they tuning out? Let me continue with this, a few quotes from this article from Harvard in the Journal of Pediatrics. And when I talk about evidence-based, this is the evidence I wish they would teach in medical schools and nursing schools, in schools of education, in schools of psychology. But I'm telling you, I know for a fact that at UBC, medical students still don't hear this stuff. And this is not new knowledge, it's not new science. It's been around for a couple of decades. I became aware of it in the 1990s when I wrote my book on ADD, Scattered Minds. But this article summarizes the accumulated evidence. Here's what they say, and this is why your work is so important. The architecture of the brain is constructed through an ongoing process that begins before birth, continues into adulthood, and establishes either a sturdy or a fragile foundation for all the health, learning, and behavior that follow. Let me repeat that one. The architecture of the brain is constructed through an ongoing process that begins before birth. In other words, already stresses on pregnant women will have a significant impact on the brain's physiology and psychology of the fetus. You can stress pregnant animals, it's been done in a laboratory in the second trimester of pregnancy, and when they're adults, they'll be more like likely to use cocaine and alcohol to soothe themselves. You can wean rats one week early. One week early. They'll be more likely to use drugs later on to soothe themselves. We know from many studies that when women are stressed, that has an impact on the stress regulation brain circuitry of the child. Lots of studies. I mean, uh, there's probably four dozen studies that I could cite for you right now if I went to that section of my computer. So, and the interesting thing is, you know, that when I've given this talk or similar information, in First Nations communities, I'm often told, you know, in our community, there's been a rule for hundreds of years that um, if a woman is pregnant and if somebody is angry or stressed, they're not allowed to go near that person. They're supposed to deal with their anger and their stress before they go with the pregnant woman because they don't want to transfer it to the baby. Now, they knew this without ultrasounds, brain scans, blood tests. And that's what I mean about being disconnected from my intuitions. There's so much wisdom in intuition and, and traditional knowledge that science is now validating. So, this process begins before birth, continues into adulthood, and so, uh, th that's why, by the way, uh, and I'll say more, more about addiction later, but um, in my book on addiction, in the appendix on prevention, you know what I say? The prevention of addiction has to begin at the first prenatal visit by taking care of the emotional needs of the mother. And then they say that this process establishes, e establishes either a sturdy or a fragile foundation for all the health, all the health, learning and behavior that follow. The next paragraph, and this is key. The interactions of genes and experiences literally shapes the circuitry of the developing brain and is critically influenced by the mutual responsiveness of adult-child relationships, particularly in the early childhood years. In other words, for the development of healthy brain circuits, what we need is relationships between infants and the adult world that is mutual responsive. And by mutual responsive, by the way, that fundamentally means that the adult world has to be exquisitely responsive to the child. 
And that means that anything that interferes with the capacity of the parents to be responsive to the child will interfere with the child's brain development. And I'm talking about not abstract psychological development, I'm talking about the amount of dopamine that will be available in the child's brain. Dopamine is the incentive motivation chemical. When my drug addicted clients shoot cocaine and, uh, and crystal meth, they're, they're literally trying to increase the level of dopamine in their brain. Dopamine is what makes us vital and curious and alive and, and, and motivated. That's also what we give to kids with ADHD, is Ritalin and Dexedrine to elevate their dopamine levels. But guess what? The dopamine circuitry develops in interaction with the relationships. So that if you separate uh, young animals from their mothers, that'll diminish the number of dopamine receptors. If you put monkeys in isolation, Adults, that'll diminish the number of dopamine receptors in their brains. They'll have less dopamine activity. They'll be less motivated. They'll be able to less, pay less attention. If you take infant monkeys and measure their dopamine levels in the front part of the brain, and then you separate them from the mothers, and you remeasure the dopamine a week later, it's significantly diminished. In other words, the chemistry of the child's brain depends on the presence of the mother. And not just the physical presence, but the emotional presence, the responsiveness of the mother. So I'm talking about the physiological circuitry of the brain. So what's happening, I contend that what's happening in our culture, <clears throat> that because of many, many factors, cultural and economic and social, Parents are no longer as available for their kids emotionally. And kids are not going up in the right environment because it was never intended that kids should spend most of their time away from the nurturing adults in their lives. I mean, throughout human history, throughout prehistory, throughout evolution, through millions of years of evolution, and certainly hundreds of thousands of evolution of the human species, and throughout human prehistory, and until very recently through most of human history, Children spend their growing years around the nurturing adults in their lives. That they no longer do so is a recent phenomenon. So when you actually look at what happens in our culture where extended families, clans, tribes, and communities barely exist anymore, where the nuclear family itself, you know, and there's a 40% of the people, are, kids are being brought up in single parent families, and they don't see their parent the whole day, from a very early age on, what do we expect? And the parents are very stressed for all kinds of reasons. What do we expect but that there should be a lot of kids with troubled brain functioning? And then we say they have this biological disease. Well, yeah, but what causes the biology? It's the psychosocial environment and the way it affects the development of the child's brain and the child's personality. So it's biopsychosocial. Then there's the birth process. Now, as you know, those of you that are midwives, you're probably gnashing your teeth over this one. But the cesarean section rate in British Columbia right now, anybody know what it is? Is it 36%, 37%, something like that? More than a third of women cannot deliver vaginally anymore in this province. Now, so what? Baby comes out anyway. Really? Nature does not make too many mistakes. If it has a certain way of doing things, there's a reason for it. Birth, as you're probably aware, is not just a mechanical event of getting the baby out of the womb. Birth is also a way of getting the baby ready for life. How? Because during the natural birthing process, both the mother and the baby receive what has been called a love cocktail of chemicals that include oxytocin and endorphins and other chemicals which promote bonding. That doesn't happen during cesarean section. Now, there are some really good reasons to do cesarean sections, probably about mm, seven or eight percent of people 
are going to have cesarean sections under the best of circumstances, and that's life-saving for child and mother. But 37%? What does that talk to? It talks to the way that my profession uh, is educated, which is sort of crisis-oriented and disease-oriented, rather than how do we promote natural processes. It also speaks to a deep alienation from, of women from their bodies, that they're actually scared of their own body functioning. And this is not deliberate. This is a cultural artifact. It's just the way we live. We get disconnected from ourselves. And so then that shows up in the fact that over a third of children no longer experience that love cocktail, which doesn't mean that it, it's over and you know, nothing we can do, but it does pose another risk for that child's development. And then, we know from animal studies that the early bonding is so important for the development of crucial brain circuits. And I won't even go into the details of those studies just because I don't have time. But let me tell you, even at BC Women's, my niece, whose eldest daughter is 14 years old, was lying on the second day in her room postpartum, or post birth, and with her newborn daughter on her belly, and the nurse actually came in and said, don't overdo it, you're gonna spoil her. Well, there's no excuse for that in the 21st century. You can't spoil an infant. And then we tell parents, when the baby cries, don't pick them up, let them cry it out. I used to tell my women this when I was a family practitioner until I found out better, but I was so convinced, you know, because, you know, if you want the baby to sleep through the night, when they cry at night, don't pick them up. They'll go back to sleep. Sure they will, because they give up. They disassociate. It's too painful. And what have you taught them? You've taught them that the world doesn't give a damn. And here's the thing. Those early experiences shape how we view ourselves. So, if I look at my own life and why I became a workaholic doctor, and I really was a workaholic doctor, which meant that I got a lot of money and a lot of praise and a lot of appreciation. Right? We get rewarded for all the wrong things. But why? Because the message I got as an infant was that the world didn't want me. Now, how did I get that message? Because my mother was so unhappy throughout the first year of my life. How could she have been otherwise? But infants take everything personally. Young children take everything personally. So, if the mother is unhappy, that can only mean that she doesn't want me or there's something wrong with me, and I have to prove that I'm worthwhile. Well, one way to prove that you're worthwhile is to go to medical school, or nursing school, and become this great helper, always available for other people. And what does that mean? In the case of my children, it meant that they had a father who wasn't available. So they were stressed by that, they start tuning out, now they're diagnosed, now we think we have this genetic disease. No, we don't. What we have is multi-generational trauma being passed on from one generation to the next. And in the Global Mail today, there's an article about suicide amongst uh, uh, teenagers in a native community in, Al in Manitoba. And they've, I'm quoted in the article. That's why I know about it. Well, if you look at what happens about multi-generational trauma transmission, we have a case-controlled example in our First Nations communities. When I worked in the downtown east side, 30% of my clients were First Nations origin. In our jails, 25% of the people are First Nations. They make up 4% of the population, 25% of the jail population. Why? Because their culture has been destroyed, because their families have been traumatized, and that trauma is passed on from one generation to the next. And that shows up in the suicide rate. And that shows up in the addiction rate. And that shows up in the rate of child abuse, because we do pass on our traumas. 
And given what I've told you about development, that it's biopsychosocial when you're traumatized, that's going to have an impact on your health. So if you look at the large-scale studies, such as the adverse, and I'm going to ask you, how many of you know about the ACE studies, the adverse childhood experience studies? Please put your hand up. Adverse ACE studies. Raise your hand really high so I can see you. Okay, that's pretty good, and it's, and it's horrible. It's pretty good that there's even 15 of you that knows them. It's terrible that all of you don't know them. And it's terrible not about you personally. Please don't even mistake me for a second as me being critical of you as individuals. I'm not. I'm talking about the culture that we live in, including the healthcare culture. We're not looking at the most important things. We're looking at effects, but we're not looking at causes. Now, the Adverse Childhood Experience Studies, and I urge you, all of them, to look them up online, because they've been published in major medical and nursing and psychological journals. But nobody in academia talks about them. The Adverse Childhood Experience Studies looked at large-scale populations. <clears throat> They looked at childhood experiences and adult outcomes. Um, a childhood adverse experience was defined as um, emotional, physical, or sexual abuse, that's three, the death of a parent, violence in the family, mental illness in a parent, addiction in the family, a divorce, a parent being jailed, there might have been one or two others. For each of these adverse childhood experiences, the risk of addiction goes up exponentially, the risk of mental illness goes up exponentially, the risk of autoimmune disease goes up exponentially, the risk of all kinds of diseases go up exponentially. In other words, there's something about early childhood adversity that potentiates adult pathology, which goes back to that article, which is that these early coping patterns and these early experiences set the foundation for everything that happens later on. Now, in terms of addiction, uh, in the downtown east side, uh, as you may have heard me say, if you've heard me speak before, in the 12 years of my work in the downtown east side, a few blocks away from here, I did not meet a single female patient who had not been sexually abused as a child. No one. And uh, all the men had been abused or traumatized, significantly so. Again, if that was only my personal observation, that might be interesting, but not persuasive. But again, that's what the large-scale study shows, and now we actually know how trauma and abuse actually affect the brain. Sexual abuse affects the brain for a lifetime. Another form of trauma affects the brain for a lifetime. Not irreversibly, fortunately, but you need intervention that's healthy and uh, compassionate and evidence-informed. But how are you going to have an informed, evidence-informed uh, intervention when in four years of medical school at the University of British Columbia, medical school students never hear the word trauma once? Not once, except in the sense of um, physical trauma. Now, what are the impacts of trauma then early in life, and how do they, um, how do they impact health? Well, one, one I've already mentioned. Uh, trauma is taken personally by the child, and by trauma I don't necessarily mean bad things, there's a whole lot of bad things happening. Let me define trauma for you. Trauma, ultimately, trauma is not what happens. Trauma is not the terrible event. So trauma is not the physical or sexual abuse. Those are traumatic, but they're not the trauma. Trauma is the impact inside the body and the mind of those events. That's what the trauma is. So what the trauma is, is a disconnection from oneself. A disconnection from oneself. Now let me illustrate what I mean by disconnection from oneself. I'm going to ask you a question. If you've had the following experience, please put your hand up. This is the experience. That you had a strong gut feeling about something, you ignored it, and you were sorry afterwards. Put your hand up if that's happened to you. Vast majority of people. Let's just look at the opposite. You had a strong gut feeling about something, you ignored it, and you were grateful afterwards. Now put your hand up. One person? Two? Okay. You see what the odds are. The odds are that your gut things were right, 
and whatever your mind said was wrong. Now, why is that? That's because gut feelings are not luxuries. This is how human beings evolved. Can you imagine what would have happened to human beings in the wild during our hundreds of thousands of years of evolution if we were not in touch with our gut feelings? What happens to us? We die. It's that simple. So gut feelings are essential to our very survival. You know when you put your hand up and I ask you, did you have a gut feeling that you ignored? And you're sorry afterwards? You know what you told me? You told me about your childhood. Because the day you were born, you were connected to your gut feelings. That's all you had. You had nothing else to go by. And the second day, you're still connected to your gut feelings. But at a certain point, you decided that it's better not to pay attention to my gut feeling. Now, why do you think you decide that? Not that you decided this consciously. It's an unconscious process. But why would you decide that? Because that's how you coped. Because here's the deal. Infants, young children, have two major needs. One need is, and the primary need, is for attachment. Attachment means closeness and proximity with another human being for the purpose of being taken care of. Or to take care of. So attachment's primary role in human life is the taking care of the helpless. That's what the role of attachment is. You can understand that human infants being the least helpless, the, the most helpless, the least developed, the most immature of any creature in the universe, our attachment needs are absolutely non-negotiable. We just don't survive without it. Even children who are physically taken care of, but not picked up, we know this, will die. Because they will stress themselves to death, and they don't know how to regulate their stresses yet. That's a developmental thing. The brain circuitry of stress regulation has not yet evolved, has not yet developed. So, if you don't pick them up, they'll die. So attachment is actually essential for human survival. So now you have this problem. You've got the need for attachment, but you also have this need to be in touch with your gut feelings. And that's authenticity, being yourself, auto, the self. So authenticity means, literally means being in touch with your gut feelings, being able to act on them when you need to. That's great. But what happens if there's a conflict between your attachment needs and your needs to be authentic? Now, how, how does such a conflict arise? Well, if you're being sexually abused, what is your gut feeling telling you? What's it telling you to do? What do you think? Get away. To get away, to run away, or to fight back. But can you afford to do that when you're three years old? Or five years old? You can't run away. You're attached to the people who might be doing it to you. You can't run away. So you have to sacrifice gut feeling, authenticity, for the sake of maintaining the attachment relationship. And now you learn to suppress your gut feelings. Because that's, that's the coping mechanism. Don't forget what I read to you from that article. Those early coping mechanisms then become a source of pathology later on. Now, I don't mean to say that all of you who put your hand up were necessarily abused. Most of you were probably not. Some of you were, statistically, for sure. But in our society, we're so disconnected from ourselves, and the parents are so stressed, and that mutual responsiveness is so little available, that children gradually, gradually, in order to maintain their attachment relationship with their parents, have to give up their authenticity. They have to start ignoring and not even feeling their gut feelings. And this happens in the best of families, without any ill intent, with nothing but love and good intention on the part of the parents. Just as a result of all the stress that everybody's under. Now, at the extreme case, these are the people, then, that end up with physical illness. I already showed you how the coping mechanism of dissociation can lead to f mental pathology, as in ADHD. Depression, which is a mental illness, and it's biological, and we give drugs, and, you know, which, you know I've taken them, they help. But where does it come from? The word depress gives it away. What does it mean to depress something? 
It means to push it down. Well, what if in your early childhood, your parents were not responsive enough, were not able to because of their own trauma or because of their own stresses to really respond to your feelings? Then, in order to maintain the attachment relationship, you learn to push down your feelings. And 30 years later, you're diagnosed with depression. Not only that, there are serotonin levels, serotonin being the mood chemical in the brain, that we supplement with Prozac and Paxil and Zoloft and all the antidepressants, they are set in those early years based on the relationship with the adults. And they're set based already on what happens in utero. So whether we're looking at depression from the physiological perspective or from the psychological perspective, we're still looking at the impact of early experience. Which is why it's inadequate to treat depression just with drugs. I mean, that might be necessary sometimes. But they're never the answer. Because the original problem was that disconnection from the self, the disconnection from the feelings. Let me tell you one more thing, and then I'll stop, and believe me, I could talk to you for three days and not repeat myself if I, want, if I, if I wanted to prevent, present to you with all the evidence. But I just want to give you a perspective. So the people that I looked after in palliative care with cancer, all the people in my practice who developed autoimmune diseases or cancer, multiple sclerosis. Let me tell you about multiple sclerosis. If you go to the MS clinic at UBC, they see this strictly a biological process. And they'll give you cortisol. By the way, cortisol, think about that for a minute. Across the whole range of medical practice, that's the most commonly used drug, isn't it? You go to any kind of a specialist, you're going to get cortisol. Go to a skin doctor with uh, inflamed skin, what are they going to give you? Cortisol cream. Go to a lung doctor with inflamed lungs, they're going to give you cortisol. Go to a rheumatologist with inflamed joints, they're going to give you cortisol. Go to a neurologist with inflamed nervous system, like in multiple sclerosis, what are they going to give you? Cortisol. Go to a gastroenterologist, gastroenterologist with inflamed intestines, like in Crohn's disease or, or, or colitis, what are they going to give you? Cortisol. Nobody ever asks, gosh, if we're treating everything with a stress hormone, is it possible that stress has something to do with the onset of these diseases? It's the obvious question. But our training gives us such a narrow perspective, we don't even think about it. So the people that I saw with cancer and autoimmune disease, in every case, it began as a coping mechanism. Well, cancer is not a coping mechanism, but these people invariably had the following patterns, that they were more concerned with the emotional needs of others than with their own. They were rigidly identified with their duty, role, and responsibility rather than the needs of the self. They suppressed their healthy emotions, like healthy anger. They didn't know how to deal with healthy anger. And they were always worried about disappointing other people. Now these beliefs that I'm responsible for other people are, and I always have to be a helper, and my needs don't matter, and uh, I mustn't express myself, because then they won't like me. What are they? They're coping mechanisms. They're what happens when the parents are, never, never mind the parents being abusive, just the parents being very stressed. And then the child learns that I survive and I maintain the attachment relationship by taking care of the parents emotionally, by suppressing my own needs. And then these are the people then that I looked after in palliative care. Why? Because we know scientifically, and there's thousands of research papers on this, and many books, that you can't separate the mind from the body, that emotional patterns of self-suppression will suppress the immune system, will disorganize the hormonal apparatus, will have a negative impact on the immune system and on the nervous system. Let me just close with one final example. Multiple sclerosis in Canada. In the 1940s, the gender ratio of multiple sclerosis was one to one. 
So if, if for every man diagnosed, there was a woman diagnosed. Do you know what the gender ratio now is? It's 3.2 women for every man. Now here's the deal. It can't be genetic, because genes don't change in a population over 70 years. It can't be the diet or the climate, because that hasn't changed more for one gender than the other, has it? It's stress. Multiple sclerosis happens to people who take on the world's problems and who don't look after their own needs. My book is called When the Body Says No. When you don't know how to say no, the body will say it for you in a form of illness. What's happened in 70 years is that women still have the role of being the emotional sponges, emotional shock absorbers of their whole families and the emotional caregivers. Plus they have now an economic role to play. They need to bring in the money because families don't make it without that. And thirdly, you're doing so in the context of less support because we have less community, less connection, less clan, less emotional holding, more stress, less support. That's why women have so much more autoimmune disease and so much more multiple sclerosis than men do. It's biopsychosocial. Now what this means for your work, just to conclude this, what this means for your work is that the future of the child is affected by how you deal with the pregnant woman, by how you help that pregnant woman recognize the stresses in her life and whatever support you can give them to at least talk about it, to recognize it, to alleviate the stress, by how the birth process is conducted so as much as possible, as much as possible, it should be a natural process where the bonding hormones and the love cocktail is delivered to the infant if possible, where the bonding between mother and infant is encouraged and supported from the beginning for as long as possible, where the father is brought in very quickly as a support person, um, where families are, especially families at risk, are, 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 are given support so that they don't transmit their trauma onto their children, where um, children are then looked after in such a way that the primary emotional contacts for them are, are, are adults and not other children. In one of our books, I say our book because I co-wrote it with a psychologist friend of mine, Gordon Neufeld, we talk about how in this culture, kids get connected to other kids way too early. Now they look to each other for emotional support and validation. And what's the result? This is the result where they always have to be on Facebook looking for, quote, friends, where they always have to be on Facebook where they're going to be liked. They're looking for attachment, desperately. Why? Because they don't get it from the adult world anymore. So it's sacred work that you're doing. And whether society as a whole recognizes it or not, the work you're doing during pregnancy, on birth, and in the early years actually sets the pattern for how people feel about themselves, for how they see the world, and their physiological and mental health. Thank you. Uh, we're going to now open the floor for questions. There's two uh, mics, one on either side, on standing on stands. And if you have a question for Dr. Mate, please uh, line up at the mic. Thanks. Well, I'm glad it's all clear. <laughs> um, hello. Yeah. Hi. Uh, hi. My name's Carly. Um, I've been studying body mind therapy for the last couple of years, so I just and I'm a nurse also, and so I just wanted to say thank you. That was amazing. Um, yeah, so good. <laughs> really great to be uh, by sharing way, let me that. You, let me tell you something. I was, uh, until I retired a couple of years ago, retired from clinical practice, um, I was walking down the hall of St. Paul's Hospital about three years ago, four years ago, and this nurse comes up to me and says, I just read your book, Body Says No, and I'm quitting nursing. And, uh, <laughs> I thought, I'm not going to rest till every nurse in Canada quits their job. <laughs> but 
carry on. Yeah. Well, and that's actually an interesting point because I, I've struggled the last couple of years with a lot of the incongruencies in what you've been speaking about yeah. today um, of, you know, evidence-based, but ignoring all this evidence that's been so obvious for so long, yeah. even in my personal life and also with my patients. Yeah. Um, so I can't, I can't say that I'll be a nurse in that same way, but I'm looking to sort of, my goal in life would be to blend those two worlds together. And by the way, why do you think you're ignoring it? Sorry? Why are we ignoring it? Why was I ignoring... The evidence, you said. The evidence. Um, just what I was taught in school, the way that I was, the evidence that was brought to me, where I should be getting my resources from, it just never came to me until I found it in my own personal spiritual right. life. And since then, it's been... Great overwhelmingly amazing. Um, so I kind of wanted to ask you in terms of the multi-generational trauma um, and the way in which we can impact children at a young age to help sort of take away that solidification of those um, defense mechanisms or, um, you know, for example, dissociation. Um, in what way, because unless you gave therapy to the whole family, in what way would you prevent the parents from, even if you were working with these children, continuously combating the same behaviors you're trying to grow in them, yeah. and they're still going to look for attachment to somebody, yeah. and possibly be looking for it in their therapist or in a nurse or an early, early childhood That's right. developer? Yeah, sure. It's a huge problem because you're working with these kids at whatever age, but unless the family situation changes, uh, they're gonna con constantly going to get re-traumatized. Yeah. Um, and by trauma, again, I don't necessarily mean abuse. They just mean they won't be connected with in the way that they need it. So, uh, you know, certainly as a physician, when I saw kids, you know, with ADHD or depression or anxiety or whatever, I really did my very best to involve the whole family. And I would say to people, you know, your child's problem, uh, I understand it's challenging for you and difficult for you, but really it's a manifestation of something transgenerational in your own family. And that, so that the whole large, larger picture needs to be dealt with, so that the child's problem actually is a sign that the family needs healing. Mm -hmm. Now, when you deliver that message non-critically and without blaming and compassionately, many parents are actually glad to receive it because they would rather believe, wouldn't you, that your child has a reversible problem to do with environmental issues, psychological environmental issues, rather than that they have this genetic disease that's incurable. Which would you rather believe, you know, if, if you're all with it? Um, some parents have great difficulty hearing that because they hear blame in it. They think that their parenting is being blamed. It's not, but that's what they hear. And also because they're so hurt themselves that to deal with these issues uh, would bring up more pain that they are ready to feel. Because the pain is already in there, they just don't want to feel it. In that case, um, so if the first is the case, then you got something to work with. If the second is the case, then at least if you can be the one adult for that child, for however long you're with that child, who listens to them, who validates them, who's responsive to them, who gets them, that can make a huge difference even if the family doesn't come alongside, and even if the child is gonna go through a whole lot of difficulties yet, but just whatever time you spent with them and your presence and your compassion and your attuned capacity to respond to the child's experience will make a huge difference for that child's development. And that's the best you can do. Hi. I'm Kathleen, and I just thought it was interesting. A few years back, I listened to a police officer, and um, he was talking about, he does programs, um, safety programs, like teaching kids to be safe, and all of this stuff. Anyway, he went all through his um, speech, and then basically at the end, what he said was, forget about teaching kids to not talk to strangers, and all of this stuff. What you need to teach your kids is to listen to their guts. Exactly. I just thought that was really interesting. And I think exactly. as a nurse, so I've been a nurse, sorry, I'm a little nervous, about eight and a half years, and the senior nurses around me, they always tell me, listen to your gut. And that's, I just think that's a real solid piece of wisdom for us as nurses and you know, health practitioners. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, and, and, and that may take some practice. Yeah. Because we were born connected, but then stuff happened. Yeah. 
And yeah. in order to cope, we disconnected. Mm -hmm. Because, again, to be connected would have threatened our relationship, our attachment figures. So that disconnection was actually a survival technique, if you understand me. Yeah. But, not, but, that, but they're still there. So yeah. that it may take some practice to reconnect. Mm -hmm. But it can be done, because they're there. Absolutely, I believe yeah. that. Thanks very much. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Hi. Uh, my name is Leslie Rohr. No, the, is it's the mic working? Now it is, maybe. I don't know. Yes. Oh, yeah, now it is, yeah. Okay. Leslie Rourke, family doctor from St. John's Newfoundland. Hi. So thank you very much. Um, I. By the way, where did you go to medical school? Western. Western. Uh, did you hear the word trauma in four years? At that time, yeah. I probably graduated about when you did, so yeah. the answer would be no. Even now they don't hear it. Even now they don't hear it. That's what's they, amazing. But please go on. Okay. They do at MUN, at Memorial, do they do where now? I teach. That's oh, yeah. great. Yeah. Anyway, um, to me it's been really um, wonderful to see that it's all fitting together. Yeah. Okay? And I've been convinced of the importance of early childhood for years and years and years since yeah. I first started practice. Um, but what I'm now starting to see are parents coming in who are aware of this and the, they're stressed about whether their child has any stress. <laughs> no, it's true. They're afraid to ha let, if their child cries for any reason, and it, it's just almost like they're hyper vigilant now because yeah. they're afraid of damaging their mm -hmm. child mm -hmm. by letting it fall down and cry or by mm -hmm. letting, mm -hmm. and I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit about resilience and a little bit about whether there is a healthy stress or not. Sure, sure, well thank you. And then uh, it's maybe a little more well, positive for, for, because some of them are getting totally... I got it, so and I speak to parenting groups a lot and what I say to them, don't worry about whether or not you screwed up your kids, you did, don't worry about it. <laughs> so that, that's the first thing. The second thing is, uh, you, you cannot protect your children from stress. It's gonna happen, it's just part of life. They're gonna fall down and skin their knees. They're gonna drop their ice cream cone in the mud. <laughs> You know, some kid in the, in the play yard is going to call them a bad name. Somebody won't want to play with them. Grandfather will die. Uh, uh, these things are going to happen. This is part of life. That doesn't hurt kids. The issue is not to, prevent, to protect kids from stress. The issue is to help children deal with stress. Exactly. That doesn't mean that we put stress on them just to teach them. <laughs> we don't have to worry about it. Life will bring its own stresses. Inevitably it does. Dad's going to lose it one night. Mom's going to be irritable someday, you know, imagine, you know. Uh, but how we, and my resilience comes, resilience is not that we never experience anything bad. Resilience is that when stuff happens, we know how to handle it, and we're not stopped and limited and diminished by it. And, and so you do that. When, when stressful events happen, you help that child give voice and you listen to those feelings and you validate the child's experience. Then they know that I can go through this and it'll be okay. So that's a very important question. And, and, and so it's not an issue of protecting children from stress or worrying about whether or not it'll happen, because it will happen. It's an issue of how do you help them, how do you help them cope with it? And the essential requirement to help a child deal with stress is actually the attachment relationship with the parents. So the, 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 according to all the research, the key factor in resilience is, guess what, relationship. Yeah. That, that was just part of the message that I was hoping yeah. could be, because sometimes parents don't hear that part, they yeah. just hear the first part and they need the second part. Yeah, you know, I highly recommend, if it doesn't seem too self-serving, that you look at the book I co-wrote, Hold On To Your Kids, okay? okay? It's about the importance of maintaining those attachment relationships for the sake of resilience. And children, once they become too connected to their prey group, they lose resilience. I just have something to add to that too. Uh, I'm a social worker at a prenatal clinic in mm -hmm. Ontario. And I think the same messaging um, we could use with pregnant women. Yeah. Because I see women all the time who are stressed about being stressed while yeah. pregnant. They've you know, they hear the research, they know, and I have to really normalize to them that it's normal to feel stress. It's just acknowledging it and learning how to cope with it. Well, there's more the to it. Way. There's more to it because th there are stresses that are unavoidable and stresses that we generate ourselves. Sure. So, uh, if a woman, for example, is one of these people 
that, that, that is always worried about other people and puts, for example, the husband's emotional needs ahead of hers, you teach them, no, you're creating stress for yourself that way. So it's not just a question of accepting all the stress, but actually distinguishing what stress am I generating that I can stop generating and what stress is unavoidable. That's the first issue. The second issue is when the, stra the stress happens then, how do we deal with it? So you teach them various stress reduction techniques like mindful, you know, mindful based stress reduction awareness, you know, or, 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 or other, or yoga, or, or you know, or, or walk in nature, or, you know. But in other words, A, we can help people learn not to generate unnecessary stress, and then we can help give people techniques on how to uh, handle stress when it inevitably arises. So it's not a question of don't worry. I mean, I agree with you. We have to de, um, take the fear, the terror out of stress. Yeah. But at the same time, we can help people generate less and to handle it better when it happens. Yeah, thanks. Fair enough? Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you. Okay, thank you. And over here now. Thank you. Um, Dr. Mete, I just want to say when you say you could talk to us for three days, I could listen to you for three days. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I just want to connect the dots here, I think, because I would be remiss if I didn't provide a bit of frontline um, experience of something that you're talking about. We had a presentation here this weekend um, by uh, Donna Jepson uh, about the Nurse Family Partnership and the BC Healthy Connections Project. And I'm really happy to tell you that as a frontline NFP nurse, we are doing that work. The curriculum involved in the relationship from prenatally till a baby's second yeah. birthday is about bonding and attachment yeah. and teaching the parents attunement and what that means. And it's very beautiful work. I'm just praying our RCT comes up with the results that are going to result in expanding that program. My question for you is how do we get the information that you are speaking about to the policymakers to expand programs like this, to provide the research. And I want to also applaud the Ministry of Health for mandating that RCT in BC because it's a really big deal. Yeah. How do we do more of this and how do we make this more mainstream? You know, that's a really important question. And um, the problem is those people do a lot less listening than they do talking. And uh, they're, not as such, they're, they're not events at such as this. They just never hear this perspective. And, uh, and also, I mean, I just give you a personal impression. Um, again, I'm not talking about individuals, but the healthcare system is more and more run across along a, a corporate model around issues that uh, involve efficiency and accountability and but attachment stress, these things are not much talked about. So I don't know how to do that. Um, I, I, you have to advocate at every level that your voice can be heard on. And to just carry on with the work and demonstrate that what you do actually works. And you hope at some point the culture will change. But you can't force anything on anybody. And, you know, I, I don't know how to get this information to the hands of my colleagues at UBC Medical School. I have no idea, you know, so I just do what I do. But, but let me, uh, so I don't know how to answer your question. It's an important, but I don't know how to do it. I'm very glad to hear what you tell me about the frontline work. I mean, I, I see that and uh, certainly this perspective that I advocate, not on my own, of course, is getting more and more listening around North America. It's getting more and more accepted now. So it's, the conversation is changing. It's changed significantly over the last 20 years. Let me just tell you about something before I forget. So much of what I've told you, I've said in other talks, uh, which are freely available on YouTube. And you may find it helpful to share my talks online with your clients or fellow workers. So you can go to my website, www.drgabormate.com. There's no cost involved, you don't have to buy anything. So these talks are available on YouTube and you can share the information with as many colleagues as you can. Um, how to take it to the people in administrative positions, I don't know. I don't know. Okay, yeah. And uh, by the way, I've seen, no, we still have some time. Hi there, right, my yeah. name is Jill. Hi. Uh, I am a midwife in Victoria. 
Uh, I was a, one, among the first midwives to be integrated in our hospital uh, in 1999. Right. Um, there were very few of us at that time. I remember. Uh, yeah. And um, <clears throat> so anyway, I just have to tell you, I can't remember now when, shortly thereafter, I went on a holiday. And I'm not a big reader if it doesn't have to do with obstetrics. It, to me, that was homework. I'm, you know, reading isn't something I normally do. Nonetheless, I read When the Body Says No. And I, I remember coming back from that holiday saying I had the best holiday and I read about stress the whole time, okay. um, which was a bit weird. But, but just that I had determined that a number of my family members were developing a health condition that was gastrointestinal and, and following along everybody. So I, I, there was a very few pages in your book that related to that that I was learning from and making some connections around um, not being able to speak up in my workplace and that that was starting to make me feel unwell yeah. and that maybe that was related. Sure enough, I find your book and I'm like, wow, there's actually something to this. So I'm really pleased to report that I haven't since yet ever developed that health condition um, and I've learned how to speak up. Um, and I really believe that had my mom and my grandmother known that, that they perhaps could have also avoided some of those health conditions. So I just wanted to share that with you that um, actually reading about stress can be a really relaxing thing to do on a holiday. <laughs> That's what you need. Um, and, and also, um, I guess just to say in terms of my experience in practice is that um, you know, I have some strong gut feelings, and for that I'm very grateful to my mom, who I think was with me at my side when I was very young. I'm also very proud to report that I have an eight-year-old daughter um, and a very uh, uh, husband who's essentially stayed at home with her since she was 15 months old because my occupation and a lack of family and community support in my life, which yeah. enabled me to go out and help other families but know that my little girl was being well looked after. And I, I find, though, that I'm, I'm perceived as being kind of odd for having continued to prioritize that in her life, in light of the fact that it also has financial impacts at our heart in our, in, our, in our life. So I sit a lot in my clients who have very long prenatal visits in my office, and as you say, they're all faced with these challenges that I can't fix. Yeah. Budgets, mortgages, husbands and wives that need to work, and, and they are stressed. So just to sort of say to the group that, you know, after 16 years of full-time practice, I can say that one of the really simple things I've done that seems to have really made a help for people is to, is to help those women validate that their stress does matter. Okay. And, and that in their pregnancy is especially a time where they'll never look back and debate whether it was worth reducing work hours or asking for more help. And the profound impact that that has had on my clients and how much appreciation they've come back and said, that in which I've often said to them what I call my mama bear, what's yeah. your gut feeling? Yeah. So here's my thought for you and perhaps something you could comment on is, is how perhaps maybe the state of pregnancy provides us all with an opportunity to um, have women get a better sense of what's going on. Because I'm a really strong believer that all these different pregnant women know what they need, which is very different from the woman standing next to them. Which means that if I can help a mom go, what's your strong instinct as to when you need to go to the hospital? Well, you what's know. your strong, that all seems to really lead them to healthier places and make my job easier at the end of the day. But you know, I don't think I need to say too much there because you've already stated uh, what you need to do, which is just to even raise that question. Yeah. Just raising that question, what is it that you need? And then what you might also do, and you maybe already do, is spend three minutes in your office helping that woman connect with her body. Mm -hmm. Like what's going on at this moment in your body? Just tune into your chest, your belly, your solar plexus, what's in the heart area, anything in your throat. And you, you know, in other words, just give them some practical tools to actually pay attention to what's happening in their bodies. I can't tell you how many times in my experience there have been decisions that women have made that may, may or may not have made good clinical sense, or, yeah. and they were right. Had they not gone to hospital when they thought they needed to yeah. go, that baby would have been born en route, yeah. um, et cetera, right? Yeah. So if, you, if I believe it seems to work really well that if you help them to listen to their yeah. guts, they make yeah. really good decisions, often where we can't give them clear advice. Yeah, this is great. a better choice or this yeah, is a better. Yeah. If they make it from their own insides, it seems to work really well. But they're not set up initially to perceive that's a good source of information to base yeah, decisions so, so on. So this is where you can Mama be. Mama uh, Bear. This, works is where, really well. this is where you are being a teacher to them to listen to themselves. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Gail. I work in public health. Um, I'm listening to you and I'm hearing you say that. Um, uh, we need to connect with our intuition and that as children, as infants and children, we will sacrifice that for attachment. That's right. And I, I get that. I've been fortunate enough to hear Dr. Newfeld speak <laughs> about attachment. And I'm also then hearing about the amount of stress that occurs that can um, influence that attachment. Mm -hmm. And it's making me wonder in... Uh, 
you know, in public health, we try to move away from looking at the individual to the social, to the systems that are happening. And as you speak, I think, is it possible, and I'm not being facetious, I wanna, I'm, I'm seriously asking this, I'm not being facetious or sarcastic, but do you see a place in Canada where we would have the freedom in our system to attach securely to our children because so typically we have all of these stresses in place in our life and we have this need for most of our families to have two parent incomes and we have the concerns that come up with all these other global issues that we perhaps were never aware of even a little even 20 years ago so how do you see parents being securely attached to their kids or yeah. in the best way possible yeah. in the Canadian environment as it is now. Sure. So thank you. So um, first of all, if you look at it on a systemic level, look, if you were a laboratory scientist and you were trying to grow organisms, microorganisms in a Petri dish, what do you do? You culture them, right? You put them in a culture, a laboratory culture. That's what we call a laboratory culture. If in that Petri dish, many of the microorganisms were developing diseases and dysfunctions, what would you conclude about the culture medium? Well, so that's a, what would you conclude about it? You conclude that it, you'd conclude that it's a toxic culture. Here's the deal. That's what's happening to human beings. More and more mental illness, uh, epidemic of asthma, allergies, all kinds of stuff. We live in a toxic culture. We live in a culture that actually significantly undermines human development, healthy human development. Now we've got miracles of medicine, we can keep people alive, giving new hips, new hearts. Somebody in the States even got a new uterus a few days ago, but it failed, so they had to take it out. But it's amazing what we can do. But as a culture, so even as our interventions are getting more and more spectacular and more and more miraculous, the fundamental culture that we live in is getting more and more toxic because it's getting more and more stressed. So that's not going to change anytime soon. So how do you deal with that? A, you have to be conscious of it. You have to be aware of it. When it comes to child, parent and child attachments, and this is where the book with Gordon comes in, Hold On To Your Kids. If kids are not going to be with you the whole day, then you better make sure that they're in situations where the adults that they are with are conscious of attachment. So if the kid has to go to daycare, that may be the way it has to be. But then those caregivers in the daycare have to be attachment informed. And they have to make sure that they build really strong attachment relations with that child and the adults in the child's life, you the parent, they the daycare worker, they the teacher, are passing the attachment baton back and forth between each other in the child's experience so that you make friends with that daycare worker and you come in there and the child sees you interacting and then you hand the child over and then he or she hands the child back to you at the end of the day. Same with the teacher. In other words, if we can't maintain the parent-child attachments, then we have to maintain the adult-child attachments. Now, there have been studies on the optimal parenting environment Dr. Darcia Narvez at Notre Dame University has studied uh, attachment contexts. And what is, you know what she found was the most optimal parenting environment? Guess what she found? The hunter-gatherer tribe, such as our First Nations people used to have here in North America. Because in the hunter-gatherer tribe, children have multiple nurturing attachments with adults, not just mom and dad. So we have to rebuild that as much as we can. And so those parents that are attachment conscious uh, will then uh, create as much as they can other adult attachments that can hold their children when they're not holding them. The trouble is, as a culture, we're no longer so conscious of attachment and so we have to be aware of it again. So, so really what we'd be looking for is at other adults who would act like aunties. Sorry? And we'd look for other adults who are going to act like adult, aunties or well, that's uh, grandmas you're, you're, and that kind of thing. You're, you're, you're creating a world of adult attachments. And so it's not just the parents, but any child, any adult that interacts with the child needs to be an attachment figure. So daycare workers, preschool teachers, teachers okay. throughout high school okay. primarily need to be attachment figures before they're educators. Mm -hmm. 
and, 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 and their educational capacities will be greatly, greatly enhanced by that, the job will be a lot easier because kids who are looking to adults will learn from adults much more easily and much more readily. So we have to create an attachment culture. Yes? Yeah, hi. I'm really nervous because you're a rock star to me. I've seen you any time that I can see you, so I feel like... Uh, what can you do? <laughs> Anyhow. <laughs> so, um, I'm a nursing instructor. I've had a short stint as being a labor and delivery nurse, but now I teach um, nursing uh, in the maternity area. Yeah. And one thing I'm thinking about is we're talking about mothers that are wounded and that carries on to their children. But one thing that I was thinking about when you're talking about C-section rates is something that I'd like to study is how, um, I wrote it down, so how a personal trauma of birth can pass on into a professional passing on of traumas of birth. So for example, a study I'd really be interested in doing would be, let's say you have a nurse who had a C-section, a very traumatic C-section, versus a nurse who's had a home birth. So as the nurse who's had a home birth really believes it can happen, versus the other one who was so traumatized by her birthing experience, does she pass that on to her patients was one thing. Another thing is with my nursing students, I did a breastfeeding class and I said, oh, how do you guys feel about public breastfeeding? And I had one student who said, I think that's disgusting. And I thought, oh, I want to kick her out of the program. <laughs> like, that really put me off. And then right away, I had another student who happens to be sitting behind us. And she said, you know, my mom had to breastfeed me till I was four or five, because we were kind of poor, and my mom just wanted to make sure that I was well nourished. Mm -hmm. And I thought, that's going to be a good student right there. Mm -hmm. I don't need anything more. That's, that's the only story that I need to hear. So the traumas that we're talking about in motherhood is kind of these are traumas that we are now bringing into our professional practices and passing on. So how, how, do, I, how do we do that? Yeah, well, look, first of all, the, the first person who said that is disgusting, your own reaction to that was what? I wanted her to leave. <laughs> oh, I was, yeah. I was, I was, and I was and that's a sign of your trauma. Oh, okay. Because... Uh, <laughs> it's true. Yeah, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Because that person was coming out of pain. Yeah. And disconnection. Okay, I'll hug so, her. So here was an opportunity. Okay. So here was an opportunity to connect with somebody, and you wanted to disconnect. So I'm not criticizing you. Yeah. I'm just showing. I'm just validating your point that trauma shows up in how we react professionally, mm -hmm. which you did in your case. Right. You get it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Now, by the way, uh, the last thing I'd want you to do, and I, and, I, and I trust that you didn't receive that as a criticism. It's just, I'm just pointing something out. So the real point is that as professionals, we have to really be aware of our own reactions. And, and, and we can learn from our own reactions. They're actually great teachers to us. Um, so as soon as you make it about somebody else, it means that you're not dealing with something inside yourself. So that's just 100% of the time. That's true mm -hmm. for me 100% of the time. Not that I don't do it, but it, it's always an interesting teacher for me when I do do that. Okay, yes. this is really quick. Um, I was going to link off of the last speaker on this side because I'm actually raising a 16-year-old who probably could fall into a lot of the categories we've been discussing. The attachment piece right now, her, her thing is her socializing is relied on this yeah. and I seen you put this up yeah. and it is so scary because um, I deal with a lot of families and the moms are this the role models mm -hmm. that we are seeing our younger generation are seeing this as the attachment it, it, what it, scares it, me is it, there, it, it, this it's, is so, it so but it's worse than that it's even worse than what you say it is because not only is the child being modeled the child is also getting a message yeah what's the message the child is getting that they're not interesting enough for the mother. Uh, however, let's reverse that. When I want to attach with my 16-year-old, she has no time for me because this has taken over her life. Yeah, yeah. Now, I'm waiting for your new book. I have that book, Hold On To Your Kids. Well, I'm, and I'm waiting for the one, How Do You Hold On To Your Kids Through Texting? Because well, 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 <laughs> which, um, which version of Hold On To Your Kids do you have? I, I have the one. Oh, does it? In the, in the, 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 I don't have that one. So it's a little, so hold on a second. So this is the last question. Let me just show you something. You don't have this version, I take it. I do not have that. Okay. Well, this version is two new chapters on how to deal with the digital age. And, oh. all, and all you have to you don't you don't have to buy you don't have to buy it by the way. 
Oh, you have oh to you're going to give it to me because no, I'm no. desperate. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, it belongs to the bookstore. Okay, <laughs> but 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 here's what you can do: you can um, write to my uh, web, uh, my my website and request the two chapters be sent to you in a PDF format. We'll do that. There's no cost for that. Oh, great! So anybody Thank who's you. got the old version, you can get the new version for free. Okay. 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 But. Uh, to get serious about it, it's going to be tough for you. And you're going to have to put up with a whole lot of disappointment and frustration. And you're going to have to find the openings to your child. Don't try and overcome the digital thing head on because you're never going to win. But you're going to have to forge a relationship with her over time. And you're going to have to do that very patiently, very consistently. You're going to make me cry. Will you stop it? Okay. <laughs> That's all. All right. Thank you. Uh, please join me in thanking uh, Dr. Mate. I know that, uh, like many of you, most of you, all of you, uh, that was a very moving, insightful, and thought-provoking presentation as a mother, as a healthcare provider, as a teacher of um, young healthcare students, uh, and as a health systems planner. I think that a lot of what Dr. Mate is talking about today, uh, we can incorporate into our lives in the many different spheres and hats that we wear. And I hope that you've all taken something home from this um, experience today. Thanks again.